I'm thrilled to be here at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, the work of both of these amazing people. So to my far left and, and your far right is Zanele Muhole, who is a visual activist based in Johannesburg, South Africa. She photographs uh, LGBT communities in the townships and in, in other parts of South Africa um, and brings a lot of visual insight to her work as an activist. Um, and she's been doing this for the past decade and runs a photo collective of uh, LGBT photographers, primarily lesbian and a trans man from what I understand. And Evan Wolfson, directly next to me, is the founder and president of Freedom to Marry, the campaign to win marriage in the US. And he's also the author of Why Marriage Matters, America, Equality, and Gay People's Right to Marry. So he also does work on globally uh, looking at LGBT issues. One of the things that I would say just to set the stage here is that it, it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison of the, the fortunes of gays and lesbians in South Africa and the United States in part because when you look at issues like hate crime statistics, there's always things that go unreported. And, um, you know, but we're gonna really dive into both the questions of culture and the questions of law. So let me, let me just start out asking something that may be very obvious to both of you. What is the legal status of gay rights? I'm not talking about the actual status, but Zanele, the legal status of gay rights in South Africa. Um, in South Africa, I think in one way we are in a better place because South Africa um, amended the constitution in 1996, May 1996, um, the constitution of South Africa uh, was amended in which um, people who are uh, members of the sexual minority groups were included in the constitution of South Africa. It basically said no one has a right to, to discriminate against any person on the grounds of his or her sexual orientation. And it means that you could express your sexuality in ways that um, you feel comfortable with without being persecuted as a member of the LGBT community. So um, in 2006, uh, 10 years later, South African government um, ensured that we had the same sex marriage, which put us in a better position yet again than any other country in the world because you have the constitution that assures you that you can express fully as a citizen of the country. And you have the right to marry, which most of the, the people in different parts of, you, of US states cannot have that access. So there's no country in the world that has those protections other than the South Africa. In the continent, as like within the African continent, and, um, and when you look at any other country in any other space in the world, there's no one who has those twins. So we're the only one. Yeah. And Evan, obviously, this has been a dramatic week. I'm so glad you're with us. Um, how has the game changed? Like, for example, um, Nate Silver, who spoke earlier this week, wrote a piece for The Times saying that there would be a doubling of the American population who could access marriage equality. Um, and, you know, we know Nate Silver's not wrong. Uh, but but how, do, how do you see the landscape changing as a result of the Supreme Court? And, and you know, do you believe that we're going to achieve marriage equality through some kind of federal legislation, possibly, or through the piecemeal state by state? Right. So it's important to understand, first of all, that the strategy that brought us to this week of victory and transformation and momentum is the very same strategy we continue to need to follow and will follow to deliver the full victory we seek. We're, we're not done. We have plenty of work left to do. But the strategy is a working strategy. So it, to be quick about it, the, the strategy that Freedom to Marry has followed from the beginning is to say, how do we achieve full legal equality in civil rights causes like this in the United States? And the answer is, in our system, the way we do that is, ultimately, the Supreme Court brings the country to national resolution. But that doesn't come at the beginning, and it doesn't come through a magic wand. It comes after you have created what you need to create in order to get the Supreme Court to do it. And what you need to create in the United States is a critical mass of states and a critical mass of public support that together create the climate that encourages the justices and other decision makers to do the right thing. So the whole strategy has always been about, ultimately, we're going to get this when the Supreme Court finishes the job. 
And we need to, in order to make that happen, win states, win over hearts and minds. And of course, you also have to have the right justices. You have to have the right people in place. And that's where politics also comes in. So that's the strategy we're, we, that, we, that got us to this point. It's the strategy that is going to get us to victory. And I believe that victory will come within years rather than decades. The Supreme Court got interracial marriage wrong before it got it right. This week, the Supreme Court did two really important things for us, but didn't finish the job. We're going to build. We're going to get this campaign to continue. We're going to get these states. We're going to get this public opinion. And we're going to go back at the right time to the Supreme Court again in a matter of years. The two big things the Supreme Court did do right this week uh, were, number one, the Supreme Court struck down the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, the federal law that said that even if you're legally married, we will discriminate against you if you're gay. And under that federal law, even gay couples who are married have been deprived of the 1,138 plus federal protections and responsibilities that come with marriage. Things like social security or immigration protections or family and medical leave or access to health care. All of that changed this week when the Supreme Court turned the federal government from being the number one discriminator against our families to now being on the side of those families. And we can talk more about that. The second big thing that changed was the Supreme Court rejected an attempt to overturn the trial court ruling that struck down Proposition 8. And the effect of that is to restore the freedom to marry in California. With the restoration of the freedom to marry in California, marriages began yesterday, that means that now almost a third of the American people live in a state where gay people have the freedom to marry. It's over 100 million people. Of course, that also means 200 plus million people live in states where we don't yet have the freedom to marry, and 37 states where we don't yet have the freedom to marry. But we now have about a third of the country living in a place where gay people can marry, up from zero a decade ago. That's momentum, and it's that momentum we're going to turn into this winning strategy to finish the job. Well, I want to just set the table so that everyone is aware of the kind of work that Zanelli does, because I want to shift into the interactions between politics and culture. So I want to show you just a little bit, um, a couple of different pieces of Zanelli's photographic work, if we can take a look. And, and your work is, uh, is internationally collected, provocative, and uh, fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. Uh... Yeah, i just like to say thanks to John and Sharon who are here today uh, for the support. Um, I think it's very, very important for, for people to note that there are still so many challenges that we are facing because it's one thing to be fighting uh, to ensure that, that DOMA is scraped out of the government's books. What is very, very important to, is to ensure that we document all those movements that lead towards that victory. So without documentation, it would mean that we never existed or we never fought any struggles. Uh -huh. So one major issue right now is to document, 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 and, and make sure that we are visible as LGBTI people of the world. Because for people to listen, I think they, there's, there'll be a need for them to look at something that we fought for to ensure that we have uh, full rights as citizens of our countries. Well, let's take a look at some of your photographs. Thanks. <laughs> Her work so obviously is not setting out to titillate, which is the object of pornography. It's to arouse, it's to titillate. Zanele's work is so obviously art. It's forcing us to think about our society and ourselves in a very, very ingenious way. I call myself a visual activist because what I'm doing is, is radical and it's based on political issues. God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. It must be going straight to God. You know, so, so that is just a little snippet, and we'll see more in a second of the kind of work you do. And, and one of the things I was so impressed by is that you are not 
um, only a photographer, not only an activist, you're also a journalist and blogger. You know, you, you take time to really investigate the world and you have a relationship with your subjects that's amazing. So I want to talk to you about that in a second, but I also want to play a little bit of how you, how you interact with your subjects, including a couple in Cape Town who were kicked out of a shelter because they are a lesbian couple. So let's take a look at that. Government and government. that I can say to a light of a lesbian story. It is now a Yeah, because now it's a The father was here, he the man who was here, he So, he was here, 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 he was the case of, of, of these guys really, really touched my soul. And it had to think that I come from a space where I could have a blanket, I could have warm water, I could eat a meal and have fun with my partner. Whereas I know that there are lesbians who are, who have feelings just like us, but they're stuck in spaces like this. It's been, Five months since I last saw these guys. And I I wish I could help, but I don't have means to help them. Come to the Father, and now you keep feet small. Broken hearts, broken lives, He can change them all. All because of his great love, he gave his only son, and everything was done, so you may come. And that's, you know, Zanelle, this is an incredible love story, but it's also heartbreaking to think of how persecuted they are, but it's also not just a South African thing. I was reading a statistic that um, up to 30% of homeless Americans may be gay and lesbian because, and, and particularly, it's rampant among teenagers. But tell us about, and, and I'm going to turn to you too, uh, Evan, but tell us about the, you know, more about this question of documenting human lives and what you're trying to show as you document. Um, I'm just thinking as I'm here because I've been exposed to so much uh, uh, richness and, 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 Finery, and I'm just thinking I have to go back home and work. Um, for me, I'm just thinking that a lot of activists and allies and families, you know, had um, um, a, a duty of dealing with the fact that so many people were rejected in their spaces. And I was thinking to myself, why documentation or documenting black lesbian lives and trans people in my country is so important? Because we come from a past where a lot of black people did not have the privilege of owning cameras and having um, uh, uh, any means of documentation except writing. And those who were radical or who transgressed the, the apartheid uh, system that was in place, it meant that uh, many people's lives ended up not being part of the historical documents uh, of South Africa. So I'm thinking now, if um, a lot of activists and artists, and like artists, I mean musicians or cultural activists, uh, documented their histories in different places in America and also in Europe, why can't we? Why can't we make sure that it's our responsibility as members of the LGBTI uh, uh, communities in South Africa do the same? In order to share with uh, so many homophobes who want to, um, to drive the myth around the un-African homosexuality, as you, some of you might have read about it, how the Ugandan go government proposed the anti-homosexuality bill in 2009. And then in South Africa, we have all these laws that protect us, like the right to marry, the right to adopt children as a same-sex couple, the right to have pension for your spouse in case anything happens. We, we in better, we, like I said, we are in a better position, but the truth is, without any images that could complement the same constitution and also all those laws in place, it will mean that uh, we do not exist. So for me, it's not a matter of like, okay, uh, of luxury. So documentation 
or uh, visual activism has formed part of like my reality and also to say that this is not look, it's not about luxury it's about lives you know yeah. and if you have places like Le lesbian history archives in new york that have massive materials of, of lesbians who existed in america about like 50 60 years ago and you see the work of Pat Parker, the work of Audre Lorde, the people who came before us and used different media or mediums to articulate their sexuality and their existence and resistance in space. Uh, it meant that somebody from Africa or somebody from South Africa had to take on this, uh, uh, the, this work and make sure that we share and also we share with so many people in different parts of the world to say, we are here, we are LGBTI people, we deserve respect and recognition through all out. In the mainstream media, on TV, the documentaries that we produce need to form part of the mainstream in order to challenge you know, um, the transphobia, the, the lesbophobia, and homophobia right. that still persist. Let me turn to you, Evan. Um, the, the America, we are a media-obsessed country. You know, it's, it's one of the, the cornerstone industries. We export our media worldwide. So let me turn to culture for a second. Both in the work that you do, how much are you concerned with image, and I don't just mean visual, but like the, the projection of LGBT life on the screen of our consciousness, and how well do you think we're doing, um, not just with the politics, but with this uh, inclusion that goes through images? So let me come to answer that, but I want to touch off on a couple things that Zanelli yeah. said earlier. First of all, one of the points Zanelli made earlier was that it's very important that we document, that we remember, that we present our struggle. And I, I think that is a very important point because it connects to the deeper point that's kind of a unifying theme here, which is that nobody hands anything to anybody. Everybody has to work for what we want, and the work is in some sense never done. There will always be more, there will always be some who have not yet been included. And far as we've come, and much as we celebrate right now, here in the United States, in our struggle, of course it's not the only struggle, the very same, the very day before we won in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. So there's much, much work to be done, and we have to be aware that it takes work, it takes engagement. There's no marriage without engagement. There's no, there's no victory without struggle. There's no progress without people taking action. And I think Zanelli's point about that is, is very, very real. And the other thing that really struck me in just the clip that we just saw of part of your work was, I actually, and this connects to your question, I think it's very important that we not put ourselves in a place where the only images, the only cultural discussion, the only presentation of ourselves, the lifting of our voices, the stories, all of which are crucial engines of change. Legal and political victory cannot come without that, and it's absolutely an essential part of our strategy and our work. But it's very important as we do that that we not only present ourselves as victims or as losers or as pathetic or as other even though there may be elements of all those things that are parts of people's lives, and there's no question, there's brutality, there's violence, there's exclusion. I mean, you know, you can tick off the whole list. But what struck me in the, in the, in the, the snippet of the story we just saw is we saw these two women strong, and despite everything they're going through, despite all the work we need to be doing to lift up lives like that, they have lives, and they, yeah. are, they are agents. And it's very, very important and I think that in now turning to your question, we worked very hard and have worked very hard to engage the voices of gay people to tell our stories. And the stories are not just pity us, we're, dep we're oppressed, we're excluded, much as we are. Right. They are, we are people who love, we are people who dream, we are people who contribute, we are people who've built robust family relationships despite being denied something important, and we are part of you. We are part of us, and our family members benefit from us, and society benefits from us being included. And that, that presentation has been extremely powerful in transforming not just the, the, the legal discrimination that we are dismantling, which we've done a good job on and still have more to do, but it's actually, in some sense, changed the question, the marriage question, in the United States at least, in the dialogue, prompted a different question, and, and it became as American, the American people wrestled with this, not only what do you think about those gay people, but it became a question ultimately of what kind of person are you mm. as a non-gay person? What are your values? How do you think we should treat other people? How do you think, what kind of society do you want to have? And we have won 
on that question because we've brought it together. So it's not just us and them, it's us. To, to follow up on that, I have a friend who is a man married to a man with two gorgeous little kids. And his, uh, his discussion with me said one reason that the uh, marriage equality fight has, has accelerated is because, as in his words, we're embedded. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about people like Dick Cheney, who, you know, his, his daughter, who is, you know, gay and, and partnered and all that, is, uh, you know, yeah, married. Uh, that's right, she was partnered first and now married. His daughter is, you know, like one of his, his key go-to people. She's a, you know, she was at least his chief of staff. And so some of the traditional left-right lines blur as, as some people, not, not certainly all, but some people on the right have, have embraced marriage equality. How do you think that the family issue, the fact that most people will have someone in their family who's gay or lesbian, um, how does that affect politics and policy? It's essential. I mean, the, the rendering our own visibility and then the giving permission and to non-gay people to own this, to be part of it, to have family members, to be good people, to care. There was a woman just after the panel I just did a little while ago who came up and, and, and basically said, essentially, it was so empowering to be in a room where people gave her permission to have the views she kind of wanted to have but wasn't sure enough other people had. That's, that's been essential, and, and it's really a crucial part of our of our success, much as we still have to keep going. Yeah, and Zanelli, how would you describe what, uh, what levers need to be pushed to have further equality for LGBT South Africans? You have the law, so what else do you need? Um, you know, I know that in some states in America there are shelters for, for LGBTI individuals where people at least are accommodated and they could be themselves. One biggest challenge that the couple faced was the shelter uh, where they got accommodation for a few months. They, they were evicted simply because they were in a same-sex relationship. South African government, uh, to ensure that this constitution and all the laws in place works, they need to build shelters uh, for LGBTI individuals because they've been like an issue of like heterosexual uh, um, survivors of violence, like women's shelters, not embracing the existence of lesbians in that space. People become terrified and they don't feel comfortable to be with lesbians. One biggest issue that we are facing, or the biggest challenge that we're facing, is violence, hate crimes, curative rapes, where people assume that if you rape a lesbian, she'd become straight, uh, she'd become a heterosexual person. Um, we've lost so many people who were brutally murdered in the past year and year before last. And the, the last year was the worst year where more than 10 uh, uh, people were killed. And five of the funerals that I documented were of black lesbians in different townships. So what we need now in South Africa is anti-hate uh, hate crime legislation. Um, there is no way that we could shy away from it and say, that in order for people to enjoy this marriage, in order for people to fully understand this constitution, let everybody be safe and be protected by the law. Most of the cases that were tried in court, um, they, were, they either lack evidence for people who were violated to feel that justice was on their side. Um, others don't even care to report those uh, cases because they know that something might not happen. So what we need mostly now is shelters for LGBTI people um, and also anti-hate crime legislation in place. And also, if you talk about the well-being of the people, uh, maybe some of you might have been surprised by the, uh, the first images, why nudity or why the, the images were, were, were of like, women like that. In that particular series, it's called Being. I wanted to talk about like, the importance of um, of safer sex for uh, women who have sex with women. Doesn't matter whether the person is, is lesbian or not, but there are people who are curious who may like to have a fair share with women who do not label themselves as, or who, who do not identify as lesbian. So the issue now is say, if you live in a country that is infested by uh, homophobic hate crimes and women are raped, it means that HIV programming should be inclusive of the needs and health needs of the lesbian specifically. We need to make sure that we have um, um, uh, um, safe sex uh, um, measures that say um, if you happen to contract any STIs, um, you are able to 
um, get medication that is proper, proper for that particular issue. So health needs and HIV programming need to include uh, women who have sex with women. Right now we don't have any st uh, study or statistics that we could speak on. So that particular one was to say, if lesbians are curatively uh, raped, some of them will end up with HIV, uh, uh, HIV and or other sexual, disease, uh, sexual transmitted diseases. Right. So there's a need for our government to prioritize that problem. So anti-hate crime legislation, health measures for, for women who have sex with women, um, and also um, the issue of uh, shelters. That's the major one on my top list. Yeah. See, so, yeah, it's funny because I, maybe we're going to do a little role reversal here because I actually, without disagreeing that those things are of value, I actually don't think, not that I'm an expert in South Africa, but at least mm -hmm. speaking from my understanding, those are actually not the most important things. It seems to me the most important thing is the cultural engagement that the law alone cannot do that is what is ultimately going to lead to the, the, the kind of lived experience we want people to have. I mean, I, you know, obviously I play a, a big role in fighting for the legal change that's necessary. And I absolutely, I absolutely believe it has to happen because as long as the government is the number one discriminator and the government is putting its weight on the side of those who beat up and, and attack and discriminate, it's going to be very hard to move the public attitudes. But I also believe, and South Africa is, is a good example of this, that the solely attaining the legal victory, in essential as it is, is obviously not enough. You then have to bring that home. And I feel like what's most important is the kind of work that activists like Zanelli do and, um, and that we engage in through these kinds of conversations and then have to go out and have millions of those conversations to make them personal and real and repetitive and engaged to move hearts and minds, to actually move not just the law, but other cultural institutions, other influencers. There are other institutions in society other than the law, the, the churches, the family, business, mm -hmm. uh, schools. And so there, there, are, there are many pathways that need to be engaged. And of course, you can't sit back and say, oh my God, that's so big, we can never do anything, and therefore do nothing. We have to do all of these things. That's how we make change, but no one alone is gonna do it. And in some ways, I feel like in a society like South Africa that has gone so far, so dramatically, in part out of recoil from the painful, horrible history that had to be overcome, the legal successes are immense. It's the, it's the cultural engagement and fulfillment and repetitive uh, shifting of understanding and attitudes that hasn't kept up with the law. Whereas in the United States, because of our much more fragmented, fractious, federal, challenging landscape, in some ways our cultural and legal engagements have kept pace with each other and synergized with each other perhaps more, um, more consistently than may be the case in South Africa. Well, let me ask you a follow-up, Evan, and then um, get you to chime in, Zanelli. I covered Proposition 8 when I was a host at NPR, and um, some of the gays and lesbians of color who we interviewed said, well, marriage is great, but we need a framework for you know, employment discrimination. And, and there seemed to be a hierarchy, I mean, not even my words, but in the, the words of one person we interviewed, an, an LA-based lesbian, black lesbian activist, she said, you know, there's a hierarchy of needs. She's like, she basically was arguing, I need, a, I need to make sure that I can have a job. I live in a working class black community. But she also said, you know, I hear homophobic comments in my community, but I also hear, you know, there was a lot of racial tensions around Proposition 8 uh, after it passed. So how do you take the marriage equality fight and then recognize the hierarchy of needs that, that particularly working class and of color gays and lesbians have? Yeah. First of all, I, th I think it's a terrible thing for any of us to feel forced to decide which do we care more about, our love or our job, our safety or our children. We want it all. This, is, this whole work is about securing everything for everyone and then enlarging possibilities. You know, it, it's, re it's, it's crazy to not care about or not say you want something that you deserve to have because you also need some other things. We, we need all of them. Secondly, I think the cause and effect is different from what the, the comment may have supposed. When I, 30 years ago, wrote my law school thesis on why we should have and fight for the freedom to marry, I made two basic arguments. And I have continued to believe in those arguments as I've lost my hair and <laughs> deteriorated. Um, <laughs> 
those two arguments are, number one, that you can't say you're for equality and acquiesce in exclusion from the central social and legal institution of this and virtually every other society. That by deny, being denied the freedom to marry, we as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people are denied something extraordinarily important and no one thing we might otherwise win would be more significant in bringing more to more of us than, the, than marriage with its tangible and intangible meanings and protections. Not that it's everything, but it's, it's big and important. The second argument is and was and remains that by engaging for the freedom to marry, we actually help people understand who we are in a way that transforms their views and their understandings and makes everything else we care about more attainable. Marriage is an engine. It's not just about marriage. It's a vocabulary of love, of commitment, of family, of connectedness that in turn helps non-gay people rise. And that was a theoretical thing when I wrote it 30 years ago, but we now have evidence. We have 30 years of evidence. And if you look at the arc of our movement in the United States, the period during which the freedom to marry work has been the engine and ascendant is the period in which we have won more non-discrimination laws, more public opinion support generally, a reduction of people who say that gay is immoral, more safe schools protections, more, more GSAs and youth protection. I mean, you just go right through the list. It's clear that that has been the case. So for, for anybody to throw away the engine of what they want is a mistake. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am assuming the woman would argue, I don't want to throw it away. It's just not top of my list. But, but, to, to, but, I, but I think the, that but your, your point as well. Is, you can't get non-gay people to care about something if you begin by telling them you don't care. Why, why do you have to begin that way? Why not go in and begin with what engages them and brings them along and then say, and by the way, I hope we can agree that people should not be fired from their job. I hope we can agree that everybody should have basic needs. I mean, there's a way to have the conversation that is what we want, not, oh, just give me a crumb or just give me a piece on something that is less resonant for them to begin with. I, I think the question of less resonant is, is interesting turning to use in LA because there have been, um, you know, in, in the film, and we'll show a little bit more of it uh, shortly, but in the film, there are church ladies, for lack of a better word, who are, you know, just completely appalled by uh, gays and lesbians in general, but also, you know, by the kind of work you, that you do, which shows nudity, which can be provocative. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, there's some collectors here who collected some of your work of um, Zulu, men wearing uh, beadwork that maidens usually wear. And that's transgressive. So it's not an attempt to fit in, it's an attempt to stand out. So how do you view, how do you view the different, I mean, gays and lesbians can be anything, can be very conventional, can be very transgressive. How do you view the, the question of how do you frame the lives of, of people that you photograph? Um, and how much is there a fitting into society and how much is there a standing out from? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, before I respond to that, I want to say that when I've heard um, about the, the push of like the DOMA, I was thinking to myself, I wonder what is the status of the um, black lesbians and gay people who are coming from Africa? Because when we run away from violence, this becomes a, a space of refuge and where people apply for asylum, uh, they seek for asylum from Africa, from different parts, wherever we come. So America becomes that space, Europe becomes that space. So in my mind, I was thinking, what happens then to a black lesbian couple who come from South Africa here in the US who is still waiting for, for her green card? Well, and the good news is, as of this week, we are now eligible to sponsor our partners. Asylum protections are strengthened. The ability to be treated as full and equal and have the same opportunity under the law as opposed to the gay exception that we had to strike down as recently as Wednesday. People are already getting their green cards. People are already, getting, are, are already having their deportation hearings suspended. And this is just one very important example of the more than 1,000 tangible legal protections and responsibilities that these, this kind of legal and political engagement will deliver to people in addition to the moral weight and the message to young people that you deserve to be equal. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what was the question, by the way? I'm just well, really just affected. <laughs> no. I'm really, really affected by this whole commotion because in South Africa it goes back to the racialized gay marriage to say who's got the rights, the privilege to marry, etc., yeah. etc. Cetera, et cetera. And right. in, in true honesty, to say what are your hierarchy of needs as, 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 a, as a lesbian or a gay person? Well, I'll, I'll give you, I uh, am doing a piece on how we make sense of the civil rights uh, the racial civil rights uh, decisions by the Supreme Court and the LGBT rights decisions. And I spoke with Irvishi Vad, whose work I'm sure you know, who's, who's uh, author and activist. And she was talking about how it's not, in her mind, necessarily about a hierarchy of needs, but a penumbra of needs. So if you're an LGBT immigrant, you're going to need American immigration law to treat you with respect. If you're working class, you need economic equality. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, there's obviously a difference. If you're coming from, from someplace in Africa, but you have a US partner, you have access to um, legal status that you don't if you're two people from South Africa. So that's, that's different. But my question was more, before we show some very disturbing footage from the film about a hate crime, I wanted to just ask, do you have any thoughts on how your visual activism you know, pushes boundaries? Because you, know, you do some very transgressive work, um, both staged and candid with nudity. And, and there, you know, for every group that has struggled, including just, you know, black Americans, it's like, you know, make sure you have a slip on, you need to look neat. Like the civil rights movement was built on fashion in a way. It was like everybody, you know, showing up for a protest looking really nice because that, you know, black people had to prove we were nice people. And your work is transgressive. So how does that fit in? Um, what you have to do is, okay, it's very important for people to understand that before a person is lesbian or, or, or gay or trans person, you, are, you have a skin and flesh. So people need not to think twice when they see naked people because sexuality is skin deep. It's not the clothes that I wear, how I talk, and, and I do things in any in, in public space. And I was talking about like the core issue there, the issue of health and the bodies that becomes, you know, um, a problem to so many people when they think like black skin and then when they think like uh, queer bodies, when they think about like the issues of health. The health is not about the clothes that I wear. I was talking on a specific topic. That's why I had to bring about these bodies in, 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 in that particular space. And also to, to say that you're dealing with different topics in a traditional space where people want to use their traditions and customs, you know, uh, to vilify and undermine uh, LGBTI people. So when you look at the material and the clothing and the, the, the regalia or the gov uh, garments that are worn by different tribes in different spaces, it means that you are contesting and challenging and say, within your tribes, you have LGBTI people. So you cannot like, um, distance yourself from that reality. If you talk about like Zulu maidens, some of the Zulu maidens might identify as lesbians. Then in that picture, you have this person who identify as a transgender uh, a woman or as a trans woman. And she's wearing this particular uh, uh, beads which are meant for something else for different people in different space for a different occasion and say, I'm part of this Zulu yes. culture. I'm part of this and I need to perform all the rituals that comes uh, with uh, what the community you know, uh, deals with their things. So there's so many things. You can't just talk about like, uh, homosexuality or talk about like people being gays and lesbians and trans etc etc without looking at deep traditions and customs that are part and parcel of that um, uh, 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 community or society. Let me can I just jump yeah. in I, because I don't want to forget there, there was one other very important thing that happened this week that relates to who we are mm -hmm. here and, and the panel. The President of the United States not only responded to the victories we won in the Supreme Court and on the freedom to marry but he did so in Africa he was standing with the president of Senegal, and they had a very disturbing but also important exchange where the president was able to stand strongly, President Obama, for universal human rights, for the progress that's being made in the United States, for ending these kinds of oppressions and discrimination, and it touched off this debate in Senegal, and the Senegalese president, in my view, demagogued uh, in a very bad way but it was a conversation that Africans need to have and that we need to have throughout the world. And of course, Lord knows we have to continue having in the United States because we're not near where we need to be. But it was a very powerful, was, dramatic yeah. moment that, that was so 
really resonant of this history and the fact that President Obama is who he is and has been what he has been on this work and his statements, whether it was in the inaugural address, his administration's very quick embrace of the Supreme Court's decision and now implementing that with the kind of federal protections that Zanelli's talking about. It's a very striking moment. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I want to show one more piece of video, which is um, very, very tough stuff to watch. And it's about the issue of uh, what Zanelli described as corrective rape, the idea that men, by committing a violent act, will change uh, who lesbians are. That's why they end up killing them. They end up harassing them. Since past 11 to 12, to 11, that, the, the man was talking that that girl the whole night, the whole night. I've been petting the engine cigarette, but for the light. So, the egg wheel and the bin are matches. For the light, then, for no child at all. The nick in a Timosiam, as a chee was a yet in Sabuya. As we are young and a pie working yaki. The, the perception in our society is that when a young woman comes out as a lesbian, especially comes out as a butch lesbian, kind of masculine looking, that they are challenging patriarchy. They're challenging men's monopoly to to, to, to male masculinity and, and, and privilege. There's also the, the perception that it's because they have no idea what it's like to have sex with a man and how enjoyable that is. Um, there's also the perception that um, if they just had sex with one man, then they would definitely be cured of, the, of their sexual orientation. These myths and these perceptions obviously are false and they are, 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 are problematic in the sense of it's violence that is perpetrated against a particular group of people. Even now, I'm still shaking. Because since I was born, I never heard kind of sound which was produced by that girl. So we enter in the way. We enter. No, we are not living. We do figure about doing about we pass pass for exit. Oh, we are not very long about living. We enter and we enter. My brother come out from the house and he, he break this window. There was that plank inside, he was covered here. So he break this one with a hard plank. So the window opens and he finds that guy on top of that lady. If it's a rape, it's a rape. So it must be punished here because it's a rape. Even if the lady is a, is a lesbian. Black men outside there, they still need education. <laughs> Lesbian and gay people are as worthy of protection as any other group of people. We are like this, we love ourselves. Our families love us like this. Why do we have to now suffer for unnecessary things? Why? Why, why, why lesbians all the time? Well, you know, I was, as we were talking right before the panel, I was looking at some hate crime statistics, and one thing I found, I, I don't know that I can do a comparison between South Africa and the US, but one thing I found was that between 1996 and 2011, anti-LGBT hate crimes in the US stayed flat. There was no decrease. At the same time, there was a profound decrease in hate crimes against people because they were black or Jewish, et cetera. I mean, how does that refract what, Evan, the work you're doing, and then Zanelle, how does uh, the issue of hate crime affect the, the work you're doing? But I'll start with you. 
I, I think it shows that there's still lots of, there's lots of ignorance. There are lots of people who feel threatened and there are lots of people who feel entitled and empowered to do what they want because gay people and, and lesbian, gay and bisexual and trans people who are often the most ferocious and highest number of victims of these kinds of attacks have the message has been sent from the government and from society and from churches and others that, that these people are less than or, or dangers or, or to be used or to be attacked. Fortunately, we're reducing that. We're, we're changing that message. We're changing it strongly. And part of that's through the law and better law enforcement. But, but I actually think that is made more real through the cultural commitment of more and more people to repudiate those hate messages and that hate permission and do something about it. And we're going to go to questions in just a second. But Zanelle, any, any thoughts on how um, hate crimes are, your work in both documenting and uh, you know, broadcasting what is actually happening with hate crimes in South Africa affects the game? Um, I don't even know how to respond to that, like honestly. What I've noticed though is that um, in South Africa, when there's rampant hate crimes in any space or anything, I mean, media is always open to report about that. And then in relation to the statistics of how the US and South Africa, we can't even compare because in the US, for sure, you'll be focusing on other things. And maybe media from here might go to other countries outside the US. So we report on hate crimes in South African media, for sure, for sure. Let the world know what is going on, just like how people knew what was going on during apartheid years in South Africa. There's nothing to pretend or to hide, because this is brutality against um, a certain group of people simply because of expression. And then in the US, um, there might be some cases that are reported on there and then. But the truth is, maybe the statistics might be high, but never reported or never prioritized where violations you know, of, um, of, of human beings are taking place in any space. We report about it. I don't know how much. And in that way, you never compare the statistics between two countries. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any questions? And do we have a microphone? We have a microphone. We have a question. Right here. Raise your hand again. Excuse me. First of all, thank you, all of you. Zanelli, um, this is a question for you. How did you go from sort of the public view of your work in 2009 that we saw earlier to representing South Africa in its pavilion at the Venice Biennale this year? Mm. <laughs> um, it's been a lot of, um, I've been making noise a lot. Whatever that you see um, at Venice Biennale is, um, is 10 years of hard work. You know, I did not start just like today or yesterday. And I've, I, I wanted to make sure that whoever doesn't want to listen that we have the constitution is in place and we have human beings who are part of that constitution. Let them be part and parcel of mainstream spaces like Venice Pinale, like Documenta, like Art Basel and so on and so on to say we are here. There is no two way about it. So I, um, I'm, I'm lucky that I work with a gallery that is so open-minded and I think that most of us are queer like that within that space and I've been embraced by the, 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 the directors of the gallery to support my work. Um, that's how I got to be there. I think you need a very good backup system in order to be heard. So without the Stevenson Gallery, I won't be uh, in any space, really. And also the support from the community, people who believe in what I do, people who trust that whatever that I'm doing will benefit so many people after us, I will not have I've made it. So the 2009 uh, incident was just one uh, major thing which really did not affect me much. I know that most p famous people will always find scapegoats in order to deal with their own sexualities. And I think that the, maybe the minister was a closeted case and wanted to use me. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you know. Um, what happened uh, three years down the line, like last year, um, my, my home, like I lived in Cape Town, and uh, the flats in which I stayed was buglet, and I lost five years of material that was never seen from that, um, from that uh, invasion. So I lost so much. So what you see there is just a bit of what I have produced over a period of time. What I documented in order to ensure that I showcase in another space. But to say that how do people make sure that I'm at Venice Penal, it's, it's been like hard, hard, hard work. And people not sure, because you have to deal with a lot of censorship 
and also curators who are not sure, do we put her in, do we not? We'll be risking you know, our jobs, maybe if we put her in. So it's a lot of negotiations before I come into any space anyways, because whatever that I believe in, I'll always say it without any fear of whether you put me in or not. Well, another question, got one right there. Hello, um, my name is Daniel and I'm a teacher in Los Angeles. And in California, um, I don't know if it's a year ago, two years ago, the, the state passed a law that we should, in our public schools, deal with LGBT issues in our classrooms from K through high school. Its implementation has been mixed, I, I'm not quite sure, but we deal with those issues at my school. My question is, in South Africa, in public schools, do LGBT issues uh, enter classroom discussions? If so, at what grade level, and how do they, how does it go? Do, do parents welcome these conversations? Because I know in our own school, and we're in Los Angeles, so I tend to think we're a little bit more progressive on these issues. Um, I've had resistance from parents and phone calls, and are you trying to convert my child by talking about people like Matthew Shepard and talking about hate crimes? So how is it, in, if you could, in South yeah. Africa? In so let's start with South Africa, but I want you to answer as well, Evan. So go okay. ahead. Um, South Africa doesn't have any sexual orientation uh, syllabus. We, that is not part of the curricula as yet. And then I know that some organizations have been trying to, ne to negotiate, like the NGOs and the lawmakers, they've been trying to make sure that we have uh, such um, um, uh, information as part of the system. Because I think that in as much as we have this progressive uh, constitution, a lot of people still needed to be workshopped. You needed to run workshops in different communities for people to get the grip. If even is saying that people need to understand that they, they, um, there are gay marriages in, in, in the US, it means that each and every state need to have thorough education in place and workshops for people in those areas to get the grip. It's one thing for us to do it alone, but it's something else to do it with the communities at large, the mainstream communities. So what South Africa needs right now is to have that sexual orientation information right now People get it there and then at university level. But if you deal with high level of unequal education uh, in place, it means that most people who might not end up at universities won't get that kind of information that they deserve. And the assum uh, assumption that everybody understand about the Constitution and the progress uh, uh, and, 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 and all the laws that are meant to protect the LGBTI individual is something else. So we need that. But again, the challenge is you are still have to you still have to deal with traditional uh, leaders who are saying, no, no, it's not done. This is against our, our cultures. This is against our everything. This whole thing is an African, and it's adopted from the West. The West is where you are doing it. So what is needed right now is collaborations between the educators in the US and the educators in South Africa. And share with us on how you have managed to negotiate with your, your, your principals and also those people who are part and parcel of the, the, the Department of Education. Because right now, if the, the head of the education department is homophobic and really allergic to gays and lesbians, it means that no child would ever even learn anything to do with that subject matter. Like well, recently, can I just yeah. uh, make one good example? Um, not only this uh, the, the homosexuality and, and, um, and all the discriminations that affect mo most of us, affect only us as LGBTI individuals, but a lot of uh, children are also affected in different ways, who are not queer but born by LGBTI uh, parents. There's an incident that happened in May, if I'm not mistaken. A seven-year-old um, boy uh, uh, was, a, was going to be expelled from school because her, per, his parents didn't declare that they were a married couple, a married lesbian couple, and a child had to be expelled from the school because the head of the school said you had to mention who is the father, who is the mother, as per application blank. Mm. So it means that a child is deprived education simply because his parents are lesbians. So we really need those collaborations and the need of sharing information for us to get it right. Well, technically we're out of time, but if you yeah. have just a brief thought on, on how you're uh, how marriage equality connects to education and, and the whole sphere of influencing culture. One of the two major life experiences that put me on the course of working for the Freedom to Marry was when I was in the Peace Corps 
in West Africa. And as a volunteer, I met many, many friends who I came to see had they lived in a society where the, the ability to be gay, where the freedom to choose your course was something afforded to them culturally, legally, even linguistically, they would have been gay. But they were going to be living their lives very, very differently. They're going to get married to a woman. Undoubtedly, both of them would be unhappy or unsatisfied. It would be, and I came back realizing, as this is when I was 21, and it was not a brilliant insight, but it was new to me. It was like who you are is very shaped by the language and the opportunities and the law and the vision that your society gives to you. So the relevance to schools as to generally is it was, only, it was only as we as gay people spoke up, came out, reclaimed our history, reclaimed our place, helped other people see us, had non-gay people speaking about, about, up about our part in their families, had schools talking about gay people's contribution as a strand in the fabric of society and so on. That's, that's the essential way to liberate people's individual lives and to get the law where it needs to be. Schools are part of that, just as this kind of conversation, just as the arts, and just as our all having that personal ask to people around us